Chapter 3 They took me back to the Roosevelt office in handcuffs. Finley sat at the big desk in front of the flags, under the old clock. Baker sat a chair at the end of the desk. I sat opposite Finley. He took out the tape machine, dragged out the cords, positioned the microphone between us, tested it with his fingernail, rolled the tape back, ready. The last 24 hours, we should. He said. It detailed. The two policemen were crackling with repressed excitement. A weak case had suddenly grown strong. The thrill of winning was beginning to grip them. I recognized the signs. I was in Tampa last night. I said. Got on the bus at midnight. Witnesses can confirm that. I got off the bus at 8 this morning where the county road meets the highway. E. Chief Morrison says he saw me at midnight. He's mistaken. At that time I was about 400 miles away. I can't add anything more. Check it out. Finley stared at me. Then he nodded to Baker to open a buff file. Victim is unidentified. Baker said. No ID, no wallet, no distinguishing marks, white male, maybe 40, very tall, chain head. Body was found up there at 8 this morning on the ground against the perimeter fence close to the main gate. It was partially covered with cardboard. We were able to fingerprint the body. Negative result. No match anywhere in the database. Who was he, Richie? Finley asked. Baker waited for some sort of reaction from me. He didn't get one. I just sat there and listened to the quiet tick of the old clock. The hands crawled around to 2.30. I didn't speak. Baker riffed through the file and selected another sheet. He glanced up again and continued. Victim received the shots to the head. He said. Probably a small caliber automatic with a silencer. First shot was close range. Left temple. Second was a contact shot behind the left ear. Obviously soft nosed slugs. Because the exit wounds removed. The guy's face brain has washed away. The potter deposits, but the burn pattern suggests the silencer. Fatal shot must have been the first. No bullets remained in the skull. No shell cases were found. Where's the gun, Risha? Finley said. I looked at him and made a face, didn't speak. Victim died between 11.30 and 1 o'clock last night. Baker said. Body wasn't there at 11.30 when the evening gateman went off duty. He confirms that. It was found when the day man came in to open the gate. About 8 o'clock. He saw you leaving the scene and phoned in. Who was he reaching? Finley said again. I ignored him and looked at Baker. Why before one o'clock? I asked him. The heavy rain last night began at one o'clock. He said. The pavement underneath the body was bone dry, so the body was on the ground before one o'clock. When the rain started, medical opinion is he was shot at midnight. I nodded, smiled at them. The time of death was going to let me out. Tell us what happened next. Finley said, quietly. I shrugged at him. You tell me. 
I said. I wasn't there. I was in Tampa at midnight. Baker leaned forward and pulled another sheet out of the file. What happened next is you got weird. He said. You went crazy. I shook my head at him. I wasn't there at midnight. I sat again. I was getting on the bus in Tampa. Nothing too weird about that. The two cops didn't react. They looked pretty grim. Your first shot killed him. Baker said. Then you shot him again. And then you went berserk and kicked the shit out of the body. There are massive post-mortem injuries. You shot him, and then you tried to kick him apart. You kicked the corks all over the damn place. You were in a frenzy. Then you calmed down and tried to hide the body under the cardboard. I was quiet for a long moment. Post-mortem injuries. I said. Baker nodded. Like a frenzy. He said. A guy looks like he was run over by a truck. Just about every bone is smashed. But the doctor says it happened after the guy was already dead. You're a weird guy. Reach it. That's for Dan sure. Who was he? Finley asked for the third time. I just looked at him. Baker was right. It got weird. Very weird. Homicidal frenzy is bad enough, but post-mortem frenzy is worse. I come across it a few times. Didn't want to come across it anymore. But the way they described it to me. It didn't make any sense. How do you meet the guy? Philly asked. I carried on just looking at him, didn't answer. What does poor miss mean? Shrugged, kept quiet. Who was he, Richard? Philly asked again. I wasn't there. I said. I don't know anything. Finley was silent. What's your phone number? He said, suddenly. I looked at him like he was crazy. Finley, what the hell are you talking about? I said, I haven't got a phone. Don't you listen. I don't live anywhere. I mean your mobile phone. He said, What mobile phone? I said, I haven't got a mobile phone. Playing a fear hit me. They figured me for an assassin. A weird, ruthless mercenary with a mobile phone who went from place to place killing people, kicking their dead bodies to pieces. Checking in with an underground organization for my next target. Always on the move. Finley leaned forward. He slid a piece of paper toward me. It was a torn-off section of computer paper, that old, greasy gloss of wear on it. The Paxina paper gets from a month in a pocket, and it was printed an underline heading. It said Pluribus, under the heading was a telephone number. I looked at it, didn't touch it, didn't want any confusion over fingerprints. Is that your number? Philly asked. I don't have a telephone. I said again. 
I wasn't here last night. The more you hassle me, the more time you're wasting, Philly. It's a mobile phone number, he said. That we know, operated by an Atlanta air on supplier, but we can't trace the number until Monday. So we're asking you, you should cooperate, reach it. I looked at the scrap of paper again. Where was this? I asked him. Finley considered the question, decided to answer it. It was in your victim's shoe. He said. Folded up and hidden. I sat in silence for a long time. I was worried. I felt like somebody in a kid's book who falls down a hole. Finds himself in a strange world where everything is different and weird, like Alice in Wonderland. Did she fall down a hole, or did she get off the ground in the wrong place? I was in a plush and opulent office. I had seen worse offices in Swiss banks. I was in the company of two policemen, intelligent and professional. Probably had more than 30 years' experience between them, a mature and competent department. Properly staffed and well-funded, a weak point with the asshole Morrison at the top, but as good an organization as I had seen for a while. But they were all disappearing up a dead end as fast as they could run. They seemed convinced the earth was flat. That the huge Georgia's sky was a bowl fitting snugly over the top. I was the only one who knew the earth was round. Two things. I said. The guy he shot in the hit close up with a silenced automatic weapon. First shot drops him. Second shot is insurance. The shell cases are missing. What does that say to you professionally? Finley said, nothing. This crime suspect was discussing the case with him like a colleague. As the investigator, he shouldn't allow that. He should cut me down. But he wanted to hear me out. I could see him arguing with himself. He was totally still. But his mind was struggling like kittens in a sack. Well, uh he said, eventually, gravely, like it was a big deal. That's an execution, Finley. I said. Not a robbery or a squabble. That's a cold and clinical hit. No evidence left behind. That's a smart guy with a flashlight scrabbling around afterward for two small filibur shell cases. Well, uh Finley said again. Close range shot into the left temple. I said. Could be the victim was in a car. Shooter is talking to him through the wind up in her ace. His gun. Bang. He leans in and fires the second shot. Then he picks up his shell cases. Then he leaves. He leaves him. Finley said. What about the rest of the stuff that went down? You're suggesting a second man. I shook my head. There were three men. I said. That's clear, right? By its three. He said. Practical minimum of suit right. I said. How did the victim get out there to the warehouses? He drove right far from anywhere to walk. So where's his car now? The shooter didn't walk there either. So the practical minimum would be a team of two. 
They drove up there together and they drove away separately, one of them in the victim's car. <laughs> Philly said. But the actual evidence points to a minimum of three. I said. Think about it psychologically. That's the key to this thing. A guy who uses a silent small caliber automatic for a neat headshot and an insurance shot is not the type of guy who then suddenly goes berserk and kicks the shit out of a corpse, right? And the type of guy who does get in a frenzy like that doesn't then suddenly calm down and hide the body under some old cardboard. You're looking at three completely separate things there, Finley. So there were three guys involved. Finley shrugged at me. You, Manny. He said. Shooter could have tied up afterward. Boy. I said. He wouldn't have waited around. He wouldn't like that kind of frenzy. It would embarrass him. And it would worry him because it adds visibility and danger to the whole thing. And a guy like that, if he had tidy up afterward, he'd have done it right. He wouldn't have left the body where the first guy who came along was going to find it. So you're looking at three guys. Finley thought hard. So. He said. So which one am I supposed to be? I said. The shooter, the maniac, or the idiot who hid the body. Finley and Baker looked at each other, didn't answer me. So whichever one, what are you saying? I asked them. I drive up there with my two buddies, and we hit this guy at midnight. And then my two buddies drive away, and I choose to stay there. Why would I do that? It's crap, Philly. He didn't reply. He was thinking. I haven't got two buddies. I said. Or a car. So the very best you can do is to say the victim walked there, and I walked there. I met him, and I very carefully shot him, like a pro then recovered my shell cases and took his wallet and emptied his pockets, but forgot to search his shoes. Then I stashed my weapon, silencer, flashlight, mobile phone, the shell cases, the wallet, and all. Then I completely changed my whole personality and kicked the corpse to pieces like a maniac. Then I completely changed my whole personality again and made a useless attempt to hide the body. And then I waited eight hours in the rain, and then I walked down into town. That's the very best you can do. And it's total crap, Finley, because why the hell would I wait eight hours in the rain until daylight to walk away from a homicide? He looked at me for a long moment. I don't know why. He said. A guy like Finley doesn't say a thing like that unless... He's struggling. He looked deflated. His case was crap, and he knew it, but he had a severe problem with the chief's new evidence. He couldn't walk up to his boss and say, You're full of shit, Morrison. He couldn't actively pursue an alternative when his boss had handed him a suspect on a plate. He could follow up my alibi that he could do. Nobody would criticize him for being thorough. Then he could start again on Monday, so he was miserable, because seven tattoo hours were going to get wasted, and he could foresee a big problem. He had to tell his boss that actually I could not have been there at midnight. He would have to politely coax a retraction out of the guy, difficult to do when you're a new subordinate who's been there six months. And when the person you're dealing with is a complete asshole, and your boss difficulties were all over him, and the guy was miserable as hell about it. He sat there breathing hard in trouble, trying to help him out. 
the phone number. I said, You've identified it as a mobile? I need to. He said, Instead of an area code, they have a prefix which accesses the mobile network. Oh, they. I said. But you can't identify who it belongs to because you have no reverse directories for mobiles, and their office won't tell you, right? They want a warrant. He said. But you need to know whose number it is, right? I said. You know some way of doing that without a warrant. Bingley. I said. Why don't you just call it up and see who answers? They hadn't thought of that. There was another silence. They were embarrassed. They didn't want to look at each other. Or me. Silence. Baker bailed out of the situation. Left Finley holding the ball. He collected the files and mind going outside to work on them. Finley nodded and waved him away. Baker got up and went out, closed the door very quietly indeed. Finley opened his mouth and closed it. He needed to save some face, badly. It's a mobile. He said. If I call it up, I can't tell whose it is or where it is. Listen, Finley. I said. I don't care whose it is. All I care is whose it isn't. Understand, it isn't my phone. So you call it up and John Doe in Atlanta, or Jane Doe in Charleston answers it. Then you know it isn't mine. Finley gazed at me, trimmed his fingers on the desk, head quiet. You know how to do this. I said. Call the number. Some bullshit story about a technical fault or an unpaid bill. Some computer thing. Get the person to confirm name and address. Do it. Finley, you're supposed to be a damn detective. He leaned forward to where he had left the number, slid the paper back with his long brown fingers, reversed it so he could read it and picked up the phone, dialed the number, hit the speaker phone button. The ringtone filled the air, not a sonorous long tone like a home phone, a high, urgent electronic sound. It stopped, the phone was answered. The voice said, How may I help you? A southern accent, a confident manner accustomed to telephones. Mr. Hubble. Finley said, he was looking at the desk, writing down the name. Good afternoon, this is the phone company, mobile division, engineering manager, we've had a fault reported on your number. The voice said. Seems okay to me. I didn't report a fault. Calling out should be okay. Finley said. It's reaching you that may have been a problem, sir. I've got our signal strength meter connected right now. And actually, sir, it's reading a bit low. I can hear you okay. The voice said. Hello. Finley said. You're fading a bit, Mr. Hubble. Hello, it would help me to know the exact geographic location of your phone, sir, you know, right now, in relation to our transmitting stations. I'm right here at home. Stud the voice. Okay. 
Finney said. He picked up his pen again. Could you just confirm that exact address for me? Don't you have my address? The voice said, man-to-man -man jocular stuff. You seem to manage to send me a bill every month. Finley glanced at me. I was smiling at him. He made a face. I hear in engineering right now, sir. He said, also jocular, just to regular guys battling technology. Customer details are in a different department. I could access the data, but it would take a minute. You know how it is. Also, sir, you've got to keep talking anyway. Well, this meter is connected to give me an exact strength reading. You know, you may as well recite your address. Unless you've got a favorite poem or anything. The tinny speakerphone relayed a laugh from the guy called Hubble. Okay, here goes testing, testing. This voice said. This is Paul Hubble, right here at home. That's number 25 Beckman Drive. I say again, zero to five Beckman Drive down here in little old Margrave. That's M-R-G-R-V-E in the state of Georgia, USA. How am I doing on my signal strength? Finley didn't respond. He was looking very worried. The voice said. Are you still there? Yes, Mr. Hubble. Finley said. I'm right here. Can't find any problem at all, sir. Just a false alarm, I guess. Thank you for your help. Okay. Said the guy called Hubble. You're welcome. The connection broke, and a dial tone filled the room. Finley replaced the phone, leaned back and looked up at the ceiling, spoke to himself. Shake. He said. Right here in town, who the hell is this Paul Hubble? You don't know the guy. I said. He looked at me, a bit rueful, like he'd forgotten I was there. I've only been here six months. He said. I don't know everybody. He leaned forward and buzzed the intercom button on the Rosewood desk, called Baker back in. Ever heard of some guy called Pubble? Philly asked him. Paul Hubble lives here in town 25 Beckman Drive. Paul Hubble. Dicker said. Sure. He lives here. Like you say, always has family man. Stevenson knows him. Some kind of an in-law or something. They're friendly. I think go bowling together. I was a banker, some kind of a financial guy. You know, a big pot executive type, works up in Atlanta, some big bank up there. I see him around, time to time. Finley looked at him. He's the guy on the other end of this number. He said. Ah, Bigger said. Right here in Marbury, that's a hell of a thing. Philly turned back to me. I suppose you're going to say you never heard of this guy. He asked me. Never heard of him. I said. He glared at me briefly. Turned back to Baker. You better go on out and bring this Hubble guy in. He said. 
25 Beckman Drive. God knows what he's got to do with anything. But we better talk to him, go easy on him, you know. He's probably a respectable guy. He glared at me again and left the room. Bang the heavy door. Baker reached over and stopped the recording machine. Walked me out of the office, back to the cell. I went in. He followed and removed the handcuffs, put them back on his belt, stepped back out and closed the gate, operated the lock. The electric bolt snaked home. He walked away. Hey, Baker. A cold. He turned and walked back, a little gaze, not friendly. I want something to eat. I said. And coffee. You'll need a at the state facility. He said. Bus comes by at six. He walked away. He had to go and fetch the Hubble guy. He would shuffle up to him apologetically. Ask him to come down to the station house, where Finley would be polite to him. While I stood in a cell, Finley would politely ask Hubble why his phone number had been found in a dead man's shoe. My coat was still balled up on the cell floor. I shook it out and put it on. I was cold again, pressed my hands into the pockets, leaned on the bars and tried to read through the newspaper again, just to pass the time. But I wasn't taking anything in. I was thinking about somebody who had watched his partner shoot a guy in the head, who had seized the quitching body and kicked it around the floor. Who had used enough furious force to smash all the dead inert bones. I was standing there thinking about stuff I thought I was through with. Stuff I didn't want to think about anymore, so I dropped the paper on the carpet and tried to think about something else. I found that if I leaned up in the front far corner of the cell I could see the whole of the open plan area. I could see over the reception counter and out through the glass doors. Outside, the afternoon sun looked bright and hot. It looked like a dry and dusty place again. The heavy rain had moved on out. Inside was cool and fluorescent. A desk sergeant sat up on a stool. He worked on his keyboard, probably filing. I could see behind his counter, underneath were spaces designed not to be seen from the front. Knee compartments contained papers and hardback folders. There were sections with mace sprays. Shotgun. Panic buttons. Behind the desk sergeant, the uniform woman who'd printed me was busy. Keyboard work. The large room was quiet. But it hummed with the energy of investigation. 